please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Laura Augustine. This is on. We'll try it out. This doesn't sound perfect. <laughs> Let's see if it stays. I have used many different microphones, but not one like this. Okay, so no, yes, is that happy closet? No, not really. Well, someone says no phone like that. Okay. Do what we can. Let me see if I can get the raise it a little bit. Move forward if you if you cannot really hear. Um, I don't want to hold it. It distracts me because I play it around. <laughs> so and then microphone goes somewhere else. All right. We'll pull that one away. Yes. How's that? Is that any better? No, it doesn't. Is that better? Yes, better. <laughs> okay, I, while he's fiddling, I, um, I did not know Monica Peterson. I did not know that this human trafficking center existed. I had had some kind of contact with Claude on someone else's blog a couple of years ago, and I thought, the way I thought, we were having a conflict. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was yeah. hot, 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 hot sales or something. And uh, all of this online stuff, I'm so primed to think that anyone, anyone who is, is doing something about human trafficking is already going to hate me, some kind of thing like that. So I'm, I'm very pleased about this warm, I mean, it's, super warm and nice for me. And to think that a young student was inspired, wow. What I usually do is situate where I was when I started thinking about all this stuff. So if you're young here, you have come into this when it's already labels and words that have come into the world and that seem to mean something objective, that there must be a thing called slavery and be a thing called trafficking. When I started thinking about this, no one was saying the word trafficking. This was, there must have been UN insider people who used this technical word because you can find it from 100 years ago, but no one. So I'm Latin American. I was in Latin America where an enormous number of the people that I knew we're talking about leaving wherever they lived and going somewhere else to work and make money and see the world. It was extremely common. It still is extremely common. And it was understood that you would not be getting a visa, that you would not be getting proper papers, that they weren't going to let you in, but you wanted to go. So this is the early 90s. And it's when I was in the Caribbean, I was working, I had a job, you know, a paid job, doing HIV harm reduction amongst tourists, gay men, and women who sold sex in bars. Those were the three target groups. So this is Dominicana, the Dominican Republic. It's a extremely poor place. It's on the same island as Haiti, IT. It's a very contradictory, rich, chaotic place with a government that doesn't work and therefore um, lots of people trying to leave. There is a long Dominican tradition of, it's called the bridge of Dominicans going to New York and coming back. These are transnational migrations in which people are going back and forth all the time. And there's no point trying to figure out which parts of it are really legal and which parts of it are not, because it's always mixed and confusing. So I'm not talking about a small number of middle class people who would have the capacity to have a job offer for what's called highly skilled labor in some European countries. These were all people who were going to go work in the informal economy in <coughs> 
the US or Europe and were going to send money home and whatever else they were going to do. Now, in the, in the, in the Mikana, there is a long tradition, there was already a very long tradition of uneducated, so these are uneducated, not formally educated, black looking people <coughs> who the, um, have only two options when they got to Europe. I was interested in Europe for my own reasons, my own history, that's what I knew. So I was interested, I visited towns where there were no women left because they were all maids in Spain, where there were literally no women between the ages of 20 and 50 because they'd all left. These are long traditions and there was an equally long tradition of Dominican women, <coughs> young women, who went abroad to Holland or Spain or Italy to sell sex. It was a long tradition. There were families with generations who did this. These are all my friends, and these are the people that I was familiar with their reality or with how they saw the world. So it was ordinary to me. It was completely ordinary. And uh, I, I visited families who were living on remittances. I went to towns that were travel markets where if you want an irregular voyage, then you can meet people who will help you fix it up, get you the false papers, take you to the airport, arrange for someone, arrange for the fake work offer. This, these are all huge topics. These are huge topics. But this was where you could go. And this was understood to be an informal travel market. These are people are called travel agents. Travel agents. That's what everyone called everyone, travel agents. So they might have a, an office or not. Um, I talked to women who were specifically now dancing nude and selling sex in small uh, road houses, waiting for the particular offer that they were looking for. So you have to understand this is not this is not formal education. But these are smart people, yes, these are smart people. They all know hundreds of other people who've already gone and come back. They are, they've decided that they want to go to Paris or wherever. They, are, they, they know what the different costs are for the different services. They hang around, they find out, they look for the deal that they want. So this is properly understood as smuggling. Obviously, this is all illegal. Yes, this is all illegal, but it's extremely normal. And this is just one place in the world, and in the course of my studies, I can tell you that it isn't different in Bangladesh, and it isn't different in Fiji. It is all the same. These are people who have heard about jobs and are going to go. Um, there were lots of specific things that happened to me that got my attention. So I wasn't studying anything. I had this job, but I remember the day that I was in a cafe in one of these in the market town and the young man who was the waiter was very friendly to me and <clears throat> after we chatted a bit and he found out that I lived in Europe, he said, if you would take me to Europe, I would do anything for you. I knew what he meant. He meant he would do anything. He would sleep with me, he would wait on me, he would iron my clothes, he would anything in order to go because the desire to go was there. <laughs> I had to disappoint him and I've disappointed many people since then because this has happened to me all over the world. But um, at, there was an event at this the NGO had a group of black bar girls who were organized, who called themselves sex workers. So these are uneducated black bar girls, hostesses. That means they hang out in bars and they pick up clients and have sex with them. They called themselves sex workers. I had never studied any of these topics. I don't come to this as an academic. I wasn't an academic. I was just a person. 
And I was sitting in the back of the room at the event that they held in which different lawyers, different people stood up and gave talks about rights and things. And I thought it was all just very curious. And then a anti-prostitution person had asked, had flown from Venezuela and had asked to be able to speak at the event. And she got onto the stage and she looked at the bar girls in the front row <coughs> and said, you have been deceived. You are not sex workers. You have been duped. You are prostituted women. I was in the back row and I thought, this is unbelievable. How could she be so rude? How could she be so rude? How could anyone come and do this? So you have to understand I hadn't studied anything. I observed this. Um, there were lots of things like this that made me that made me ask big questions. Why? What is the pro so the first question was what is the problem with prostitution? Why should there be any <laughs> What's the big deal? Since I have known people my whole life who sold sex, sometimes or all the time, and I knew all, of, I couldn't understand. So what's this about? Um, in the end, I decided that there must be books to read. <laughs> so, so I went back, I, uh, you know, I was already over 50. I went back to get a master's degree somewhere. And um, I thought there would be, uh, <coughs> books that would be interesting to me, and there wasn't a single book. <laughs> there wasn't a single book. I remember the day that I entered the University of Massachusetts library, and I had the call number, and I found the prostitution section, and there were hundreds of books, and I started reading them, and they all said the same thing. And none of them applied to anything like what I knew, and they were all arguing about ideology and how you were, so I thought this is really, you know, that I have more questions. Um, I did field work in Madrid with, where I watched migrant women who had succeeded in getting to Madrid, which is a, it's a major capital city, it's full of migrants, it's, I mean, it must be half migrants by now. Loads and loads of people selling sex from all over the world, um, and I watched this was outdoor, this place that I went was outdoor, where I watched all the helpers' vehicles, the outreach and the, and the scandalized people and the doctors and everyone else would pull up in their vehicles and go up to these women and also transsexuals in this place and talk to them, offer them things. And then they would leave. And then I would stay and listen to all of these people who were now my friends talking about how absurd this was. What do they? What do they think we're? What do you think we're doing? I don't know, like what? So I. Those were my questions. That's how I got into this. Um, I should say that there are certainly as many men, transgender people, transsexual people, transvestites, whatever. All those terms are there. Certainly as many as women in the sex industry. The reason that I'm talking about women is that that's what the trafficking uproar is about. It's about women. No matter how many times you insist that there's labor trafficking and those poor men and everything, yes, okay, a little bit, but people think that the problem is about the women. Um, in migration policy, the only way you get to get in is if you have what's called you're highly skilled, um, but the word of these unskilled situations gets around everywhere, and many scholars, migration scholars, <coughs> have pointed out that yes, so people who are leaving their countries in this, in this way know that what they are doing is extra legal, but they do not perceive it as criminal because they know many, many people who have done this and who come back and forth and who spend three months in Spain and come back home, <coughs> build houses, they've done all of this stuff. So yes, it's not kosher, but it's done. Um, the question of, you see this all the time, the question of why anybody leaves. I, <laughs> I'm going to say the word refugee once in this talk 
because that is the word that people hang on to as though that's going to justify all of this all of this naughty behavior that they're really refugees, there's really something horrible that they had to run away from. That is the case of some people, but not most. We're not even close to most, no matter what the European newspapers show you about the boats and everything, that is a very tiny amount. Most people are arriving on airplanes with fake papers, that's what they're doing. Did they, were they miserable enough at home? Well, Presumably, they had good reasons of their own to leave. There might have been family pressure. Maybe there was a, they were going to be pushed into marrying someone they didn't. Maybe there were no jobs at all. Um, maybe they, it was a dead end. They thought it was a dead end. For me, these are people who have a sense of adventure, who are willing to take risks. So that is not everyone, not everyone will do that, even amongst the most desperate refugees. That's not going to happen. So here we are, taking these trips, getting to the other side. What are the jobs that are available? If you are men, you can work in, do the manual heaving and hauling on construction sites. You can work in kitchens. And you can work in industrialized agriculture under plastic. These are not great jobs. They're not great jobs, but women don't get them. There's two options. There have always been two options for women. I doubt that that's going to change anywhere near, anytime soon. You can be a maid living inside someone's house <coughs> in feudal conditions, or you can sell sex. Those are the two. That's it. There just isn't anything. So all of this stuff about people having been told that they would be, have some wonderful job, that's silly. That's silly. People know perfectly well. They know that they've got these two options. And they discuss it. And I was in lots of these discussions where they said, well, I don't know. I don't know if I could stand it. I'd rather die than be a maid. I can't think of anything more humiliating than living, having to sleep on the, because a maid is an endless job. I would never, I would never do that. And of course, then there were other women who said, I would rather die than be a prostitute. I would do anything. I don't care how disgusting and how little money I get. Because of course, to be made, you get no money. And to sell sex, you get a lot of money. I mean, you certainly get 10 times as much. And according to which kind of job in the sex industry you get, you get a lot more. And you have flexible schedules. So I understood this to be personal, personal preferences, not a big deal. Um, both of these jobs for women are largely hidden. So of course, the press go after these pictures of women selling sex in the street. This is also some tiny, tiny percentage of the total of people selling sex now. But of course, that's where the helpers and the press can get and talk to those people and take pictures and say it's, it's awful. Um, there is no commotion at all about the maids. And that, by the way, is what I was more upset about at the beginning, because they live in feudal conditions for no money with an endless, <coughs> they're asked to do everything and anything. And by the way, they have to have sex with someone in the family very often. Um, but, so what I wanted to know was, well, so what's the problem with prostitution? And then, so what, so then what do they mean by prostitution? Because I could already tell that people were meaning different things. Um, which is this? This is page 60. Okay, so I wrote that, this is Sex of the Margins. Uh, the debates assume that an object of study exists. To perpetuate the prostitution debate, participants must ignore a wide variety of activities constituting the sex industry which occur in different cultural circumstances. Services include manual, oral, and penetrative stimulation of genitals and other body parts, massage, erotic conversation <coughs> in person by telephone or via the internet, dance on stages, tables, between viewers' legs, 
watched on websites or in peep shows, and variously called striptease, lap dancing, pole dancing, table dancing, exotic dance. Bondage and domination that may include spanking, whipping, cross-dressing, and other fetishes with clients either dominant or submissive, sexual healing and therapy, attentive company at dinners and events, new services like table waiting and telegram delivery, and acting in sexual cinema. And I can tell you that there's more on this page. There's more. And so my question was, well, what good is the prostitution word? Is all of that prostitution? If we did a poll right now of people in the room, I guarantee you that we wouldn't all agree. That people would say, no, but it has to be like this, but it doesn't, it only counts if you actually blah, blah, blah. It's endless. And um, so I realized that the conversations that were going on, these endless repetitive debates that Claude has also had to endure, uh, they're dysfunctional because the terms being used by the different people are not the same. And so they're just like it's the conversations that don't arrive anywhere because people are talking about different things. Um, there is a rights movement, I'm not going to take time over this, that uses the term sex work and wants labor rights and decriminalization of, of, of different kinds of sex labor. That's super interesting and I'm sure you can find, you've already had other people to talk about it and you will have again. I can say that the people that I'm talking about, very many of them identify selling sex as their job, but they wouldn't call themselves sex workers and they wouldn't call themselves prostitutes either. In Mexico, they say, I work at night. There are all kinds of things. So you can just say, I'm a stripper. You don't, people don't use these terms, and people who are avoiding think of things to say that are you know, really sound different, not because they feel horrible, but because they know <laughs> that there's going to be someone in the room who's going to start shouting and feeling sorry for them and calling the police. Um, so the, Lots of the people that I knew were choosing the doing the sex work because it, the flexible schedules and the freedom to take care of their children, pick up their children from school, and because now you have these family reunification projects, even if everybody's illegal. So I wondered about sexuality, like what's the problem here? We have a zeitgeist in which understanding what you're Developing your sexual identity is important, that you should be, we should be t tolerate diversity, that um, we should be liberated, that all sexual expression was good, and that we're progressing, we're somehow we're going somewhere to where it'll all be fine. Except if there's money in it. So then you put money in it, and everybody becomes hysterical. Now, so by then I had, I had understood. By then I was doing a PhD in, the, in somewhere in Great Britain. And I, <coughs> was, I realized, look, the only way to understand this is anthropologically. How could you possibly understand? We've been through all this stuff about all the things you can do sexually that are OK. And now you put money in it. What happened? Does money has some magic. It has a magic quality to ruin the sex. It ruins the sexual relationship. This is really bizarre. I mean, 19th century <laughs> anthropologists studying people in Tahiti noted things like this. Oh, look, fetish about, yes, you can't have seashells on the table next to the food. That's a, that's a fetish, right? So this is a genuine fetish. Um, you get into all these ideas about good versus bad sex and the prostitution as a social evil, as a special terrible thing. I did long, I must have taken a year of my PhD just doing the history of prostitution. There's a good chapter on it in this book. I won't go all into it because there's not enough time, but it was super interesting. It was not always the way it is now. Before the 19th century, in, let's say we're talking now about Western Europe, Europe in general, it prostitutes what 
whatever they were calling themselves at the time, they probably didn't call themselves anything, women who sold sex were considered part of the community. Identity not really the greatest, right? A little bit naughty or nasty somehow, but part of the community not rejected, certainly not considered victims, considered maybe perverted, bad, bad women, muggers, things like that. Um, the change from this was during a period in Western European history called the rise of the social. I'm one of the few people that is really interested in this period because this is when poor, non-bourgeois people were identified as needing to be raised up. So this is after the various revolutions. It was no longer thought that kings had absolute power. This was finally, after wanting to be, have power for so many centuries, the bourgeoisie came into their own. And governments were composed of people who had to make decisions about what was good for the populace, what they need, how we would advance, which now you're all now completely inside of this, but that didn't exist either. So it started to exist. And they were, so they had to pronounce on how, how everyone should live. And they discovered that vast numbers of poor people didn't live in nuclear families, they hung out in the street, they were drunk all the time, they had sex outside of marriage, they didn't bother to get married. This was very common, and they all worked, they had berries, and they were drinking gin and, and sleeping in the street. And you can see, <laughs> People like Hogarth, you know, did lots of pictures of this. Um, at this period, this was identified as terrible, <coughs> and the prostitute, the woman who sold sex, was one of these, one of these terrible things. And the idea was that they were not. The change was that there was no destiny, that you were not born destined to be something, that you these women had been played a bad car, and by circumstances they were forced to do this, but they could be raised up out of it. They could be rescued and rehabilitated. And that's where all this began. It began 200 years ago in Northern Europe, the idea that these women don't, don't really want what they have. This was extremely helpful to me to understand. Um, at the same time, in this period in Northern Europe, <coughs> there were more and more women who needed jobs. They didn't want to be married. They wanted to get away from bad husbands. They, and there were no jobs available for women with a little education. The only thing you could do was be a governess or a nanny. So it just so happens that these are the people who were seen to be perfect people to save all these prostitutes, you see. There was a finding of the ah, so the, 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 the woman, the domestic woman has a special capacity to be able to lift up the poor. And if the poor is a prostitute, is a woman, a poor woman, then it needs to be a woman. And you get the beginning of this entire thing that I came to call the rescue industry, in which women were thought <coughs> curiously warm and caring and perfect to do this. And I read in enormous numbers of diaries of these women who saw themselves as um, called to do this. So that was 200 years ago. And nothing has improved for the women who sell sex. Nothing. And what do we have? We have an enormous social sector that tries to save them enormous numbers of bureaucrats and people in direct services out from volunteers on outreach to people working in the shelters. We have an enormous <coughs> apparatus for getting people to stop what they're doing because it's perceived that their situation is so horrible. But for the people who are supposedly being helped for these 200 years, nothing has improved. The only thing that you could actually say has improved is that now we have better epidemiology and therefore if you have some kind of sickness, you can get 
pills and operations and things. That's about it. Nothing else has, has improved. So the question is what impedes change? Um, obviously, a lot of the people that are in this rescue industry feel that still feel in the 19th century melodramatic sense that prostitution is a fate worse than death, that there is something inherent in it. So I, as the naked anthropologist, simply look at that and think, okay, look, obviously a lot of you feel that if there's money in the sexual relationship, it is ruined and you you couldn't bear that. That would be the most horrible thing that could happen to you. So my response is, then you should stay very far away from it because you <laughs> wouldn't like it. But it turns out that just as many people, possibly more, no way to measure, don't feel that way about it. They don't feel that anything is ruined. They're able to imagine instrumental sex. They're able to imagine loving someone over here and having sex with them and having another kind of sex over here, it's not a problem. And so these two have no way to communicate. It's as though you were having a, a, a God conversation. So like a religious conversation. You either believe in God or you don't. Well, so that's that. We're not going to be able to convince you. So these endless debates are super pointless. And those are the ones that I bowed out of at a, a while back. Um, my interest after doing all the research was on the contemporary rescue industry. I did different kinds of um, field work in Spain for this book. Um, as you know, the, the goals are to get, to get people to get out of the sex industry, um, to stop men from buying sex, <clears throat> and they always focus on the poorest and the worst. So the question is, and I know you've all studied this, well, where did the trafficking come in? Well, a few years after I started, I got into lots of trouble because people said that you're talking about trafficking, and I didn't know what it was. Um, in the year 2000, the UN uh, Convention on Transnational Organized Crime was published with two protocols, one on um, trafficking and one on smuggling. So there we are in 2000, smuggling, people smuggling was still considered an important thing that we would talk about. You're now lucky if you ever hear about it because everything is called trafficking. But at that time, it was those two possibilities. But I saw it immediately, so by now I was uh, studying this stuff as a, you know, in the kind of way that you are. And I realized right away, okay, well, we're completely screwed because these two protocols are gendered. Protocol on trafficking mentions women and children, women and children together, right? If you know Cynthia Enlow, she wrote about this weird thing that goes on in development discourse in which women and children are something here that operate together and men are over there. Um, so in the trafficking protocol, women and children and sex are mentioned. And in the smuggling, men are mentioned as people who pay others to help them get abroad and get jobs. Well, just as many women do that as men, but you wouldn't know it from the protocols. That's where this all went wrong. The convention is on organized crime, so the frame from the year 2000 was crime. Not migration policy, not labor markets, who gets to have which job, if you are an uneducated person and you migrate, what kind of job you can get. And it's all framed as crime. <coughs> so crime requires perpetrators and victims. Um, you already know. <laughs> you know this. So this, I was there, I was doing this PhD, and this happened, and I thought, oh, we are screwed now. And it is now accepted by the people who were participated in that, that the trafficking frame, that it was all a mistake, that this was a terrible mistake, that, it, that it's not what they, anyone meant to say, um, that these are family and friend networks, um, that there's very little organized crime involved. So you understand that this is all taking place in informal, there are informal deals, they're undocumented migrants. Therefore, the people who have traveled 
and are getting jobs have no rights, right? This is, this is in the gray economy. So therefore, there are no regulations. And while most people who are smuggled and who do smuggling are fine, it's a business that they run, and they want to have repeat customers, and they don't abuse anyone, since anyone can get into the business, obviously you get some crappy opportunists capable of doing bad things. Of course, if you look at the media, that's the only thing that's ever talked about, because it's not news that other people just came and now they're working in you know, the back of La Fiesta restaurant, but nothing horrible has happened to them. Um, if you are in this situation, and you are abused by someone in your job, <coughs> then you don't have any rights, so you're not going to the police to complain, are you? At least most people think that's a big mistake, because the only thing that will happen to you is that you will be deported. So your whole point was to get there and make this happen. So even if something horrible happens to you, you don't go to the police. So this is the effect of calling all of this crime is that these people who actually have something bad happen are probably never talking about it. Um, take the example and the many examples of live-in maids who are abused horribly by the, their employers and who eventually escape. There's always people escaping from everything. They're not locked in basements somewhere. It's not like the pictures. They're in crappy situations and they escape. So what can you do? So what does this Dominican woman in Madrid do when she escapes? Well, the Dominican in Madrid has one big advantage, at least they all speak Spanish. So that's a, that's a good reason to go to a country that, where you have a colonial relationship because then <laughs> you'll be able to speak. But so she's going to go talk to other undocumented migrants about possibilities and she's going to hear about different sex work, different sex jobs, different situations. And she's going to have to decide, okay, do I even want to go to the police and be deported, or will I do this? And so lots of people give it a try. And there are lots of different kinds of situations to do it in, and lots of people work it out okay, and that doesn't have anything to do with being happy about it. Or, you know, um, at least it pays a lot more, so that if you do arrive with a debt, then you will be able to get out from under that debt much faster, 10 times faster, if you sell sex. If you're a maid, you're going to be trapped in that feudal life for years. Um, it's, these are, I, all, I see these as pragmatic individual kinds of preferences. Um, as you know, this has turned into, at some point, some years ago, people began using this word sex trafficking. And I said, that's absurd. There's no such thing. I still say that. There's no such thing. <laughs> what, what does that mean? It means that if you have all this other vague stuff that's supposed to be wrong and it has sex in it, it's now sex trafficking. It doesn't make any sense to me. So you have this huge proliferation of terms for this stuff in which trafficking no longer supposedly involves even moving from anywhere, in which everything that used to be called pimping is now called trafficking, in which law and order opens their every, every special victims unit chapter with uh, sexual crimes are considered the most heinous. And I thought, hey, it's, really, it's really anthropologically, this is super interesting. Like, who said they are the most heinous? Who said that? <laughs> This is, right now, this is the way people talk. There are perfect parallels in this with an event that happened in this country only a hundred years ago. The white slavery panic is identical. It is identical. They were considered to be white ladies from Europe who were being forced to go to Argentina or New York or whatever it was. It's identical. They never found much evidence for any of it. It was exactly blamed the Jews and blamed the Russians and blamed them. <laughs> and 
it eventually died out, but there were very similar kind of confusions with <clears throat> all possible stealing young girls and kidnapping, and that all already happened, and always this denial that there would be any kind of instrumental, rational choice on the part of anyone. Well, I'd rather this is a better option than that other one over there. Um, in, so this book was published in 2007, sorry, 2007, so it's 10 years <coughs> ago. It's still 100% relative, relevant. That is to say, nothing has improved at all in these terms that I'm talking about. It is much worse in many ways because the rescue industry is gigantically bigger. I could never have imagined I mean, I probably wrote this in 2003, 2004. I could never have imagined that we would have movie stars traveling to countries and getting pictures taken with trafficked women, that there would be um, DJs doing evenings in which all the money would be donated, in which there would be marathon runs for people against trafficking. I would never have been able to imagine anything. So that you can talk about whether that's good or not. They clearly are promoting still bourgeois family values in which women are seen as caring and domestic and everything. So the question you have to ask is, so what do they have to offer this rescue industry? What are they offering? Shelter. Shelters in which a few women are have to be put through this horrible thing called rehabilitation, which usually doesn't work, and lots of people are, you know, there's escape attempts all the time and successful. Um, the, only, the only job that is conceived as an, as an alternative is the same one that was conceived 200 years ago to be a maid. Well, maybe it could be a cashier, you know, in a safe way or something, but they're the low prestige, low um, paying jobs that are offered after being in shelters. But you have to imagine in this anthropological way that, that somehow they can say from a fate worse than death. Which I'm sure that many of you do not think that this is a fate worse than death. <laughs> But that's what everyone seems to be maintaining in this very pompous discourse that goes on. What does the rescue industry get out of this? They get to feel good about themselves. I'm sorry, but I'm, you know, I'm as cynical as you could get. And I say that from having continued to study what is done to try to save migrants and save, yes, for now it's a, now it's almost 20 years, but I mean, so it's 10 years since that. I blog and I, I'm on Facebook, I make very snarky comments all day long on Facebook and Twitter if you want to tune in. Because I can't, uh, like Claude said, it's unbearable to take it seriously <coughs> anymore. It's shocking. Oh my God, now what are they, now what are they saying? Um, so, but it does provide all these jobs for members of the sex industry. And I'm members of the rescue industry, and I'm aware that some of you will hope to work in those kinds of services. And that's so the question is can you be reflexive enough about what you're doing if those are the kinds of jobs that you get? I do. I get emails from people that say, I am a member of the rescue industry, but I really try to do a good yes, well, keep trying. Keep trying. Keep trying. Now, the question that I haven't addressed because it's so so awful is the question of feminism, the role of feminism in this. For someone like me, there's different streams of feminism. I don't have any problems with that. I'm not worried that we don't all agree. I see this in a very long term. Oh, look, women's rights, women's liberation, suffragettes, moving on, coming up with, but. You now have some kind of argument that I'm in the center of. I'm a hated person by these radical feminists, fundamentalists, I call them fundamentalists, who imagine that we're going to return, that we have to return to some pure roots that began, oddly enough, in the 1960s. 
when sex sexual liberation was a thing. So they really hate me because I was there. I'm one of these kids in the 60s, a counterculture kid in the 60s. No one ever talked to me about prostitution. People sold sex or they didn't. It wasn't a big deal. And the kind of women's liberation that I was involved in was about listening to individual women say what they wanted. That's what it was. This is now not what's going on in, in ideological debates. It's as though there's a Bible and we have to discover what will be the perfect feminist position to take on everything in the Bible. It's very well funded. The reason that it continues is that it's very well funded. Um, most of the people that I know don't feel this way at all. They don't mind. They don't care about sex work any, any more than they care about anything else. It's another one of the crappy things in the world that isn't solved. You know, these are not... So my, my advice... Do you see what a mess this is? It's a terrible mess. So to be able to work inside this field, and I've only been talking about this one little, I mean, we could have another whole thing about men who get those um, agricultural jobs. It would be a similar, it would be a similar story with the same crazy kind of things going on. Is that you have to be able to maintain immense contradictions not imagine that you're going to arrive at the bottom line and that you will know which is the correct definition for trafficking and which is the real meaning for slavery. And by the way, all of this is set to be replaced with the word modern day slavery very soon. It's already happening in um, England and there are these diplomatic pacts that have been done so that it will all now be called slavery. And I won't even get into that because this is not chattel slavery in the sense that you know it in this country. Um, the way to think about what these people are doing is as precarious labor, freelance, unregulated, in informal economies. <coughs> informal economies <coughs> are not crimes. The informal economy is bigger than the formal economy in some important countries like India and Brazil. The idea of formal recognized things, this is not kept up with what has happened in the world and what kinds of jobs that there are. And I recommend considering human mobility, that the way this earth was populated was by people moving. It seems to be that one of the most basic impulses of the human being is to want to go and see what's over there, to try what's over there. This is why we have all these populations in all these different places. They didn't start out everywhere in the world. They had moved everywhere. So these are mobility stories. Um, any policy that anyone is trying to push has to be able not to come up with one, one policy that will work for all of these people, but to be able to handle people. Okay, it turns out that those people are okay with that, and these people uh, would like to be rescued. And I was in Norway giving this talk once, and a Norwegian migration scholar standing next to me said, but so what you're saying, he said, is that we should let these migrants work for less money because to them it's a lot of money. And then, the, and I said, yes, that, that's what I'm saying. He said, but, but you can't have that. In Norway, everyone has to get the minimum wage. And what's the minimum wage? Well, the equivalent of, you know, $30 an hour, right? So that's impossible. The idea that you would have a tier of people who were willing to take less because they were much better off goes against everything about equality that they know, right? Um, 
But in my view, you would have to not try to come up with one policy for some word that means nothing at this point, like trafficking or slavery. You have to try to not oversimplify and not try to have these binaries that Claude mentioned, where, okay, so this is like this, and that one's like that, and this is good, and that's not good, and now I can go home and not think about this anymore. No, you're going to be staying up all night worrying about, oh, I mean, people who have these jobs who interview people and have to listen to these complicated stories, which, by the way, are also filled with lies and pretenses and things, to try to figure out, so what was wrong? really hard, but migration policy could be more open, allow more work permits for more kinds of jobs that are not called highly skilled, we're not all doctors and IT experts, right? The reason that someone goes from the Dominican Republic to Italy is because they know perfectly well that there are all these kitchens in the south of Italy where they'll get jobs. They've been offered the jobs and they're going to get them and whoever else lives in that part of Italy doesn't want them. This is obvious, this is common sense. So what you would do if you had more jobs with work permits is that you would have more people who, in the case of something going wrong, would be able to go and object. So they're not going to go and object now because, it's, um, because they'll get deported. So they would be able to. So you give people a, a leg to stand on. Um, you know, trafficking, whatever that is, is not the problem. The problem is framing this mobility of women as much as men as crime. Um, so in my view, we've actually gone backwards a good way. Um, there are more victims. Why? only because these <clears throat> insane, panicky kinds of conversations have labeled almost all migrating women as victims. The word that's used is vulnerable. Somehow you have this tremendous infantilization of any woman that doesn't live in the United States or Europe. Oh, just like the children that you have to take care of. You have tremendous amount of um, uh, colonialism where yeah, where it's imagined that the, that the person from the United States is able to go to Thailand and walk into these hostess bars and somehow know what's going on. The whole idea is that somehow the rescue industry people in these countries know best how to, to deal with everyone else's life. Um, I think most ordinary people are not this silly, frankly. Whenever I'm out and around people and they have any idea, then they will mention something about, oh yes, you know, the grocery store on the corner, that man, I never was clear, he came from Lebanon, but how did he? They, people know that that's how it happens. Um, I would say, you know, you need more listening to migrants and sex workers. Um, and trust what they say. And I'll <coughs> finish just by reading you. This was an early quotation that inspired me from a Filipina migrant <coughs> in Switzerland. So this is already 15 years ago. She said, we look at migration as neither a degradation nor improvement in women's position, but as a restructuring of gender relations. This restructuring need not necessarily be expressed through a satisfactory professional life. It may take place through the assertion of autonomy in social life, through relations with family of origin, or through participating in networks and <coughs> formal associations. The differential between earnings in the country of origin and the country of immigration may in itself create such an autonomy. <clears throat> even if the job in the receiving country is one of a prostitute.